After the disastrous Kentucky campaign, the Confederate Army of Tennessee had marched back into East Tennessee and then prepared for a movement against Nashville. The whole campaign had just cost needless death and a tactical victory but strategic defeat for the Confederate Army's commander, Braxton Bragg, and the tens of thousands of Kentuckians he theorized that would flock into his invading army did not materialize. President of the Confederacy Jefferson Davis approved the movement made into Middle Tennessee and the Army of Tennessee started its march. Union General William Stark Rosecrans replaced General Don Carlos Buell as commander of the newly named Army of the Cumberland. Previously, Rosecrans had done good service in the assaults against Corinth, Mississippi. Abraham Lincoln, who back in September had issued the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, knew that the full proclamation would take effect on January 1st, and he needed victories to validate taking such a strong action. In the East, General Ambrose Burnside led the Union Army of the Potomac during one of the Union's most disastrous defeats. This next engagement would do much to calm the nerves of the President. Throughout November and into December, the Confederate cavalry commands of Nathan Bedford Forrest and John Hunt Morgan had plagued Rosecrans' army, who was preparing for their own movement against the Confederates occupying Murfreesboro. However, in late December, Bragg sent both Forrest and Morgan on raids into West Tennessee and Kentucky, respectively, leaving only the cavalry under Joseph Wheeler to act as the eyes and ears of the army. Rosecrans wasted no time in moving once those threats were gone, and he moved his army along three routes the day after Christmas. The Union commander brought with him around 40,000 men, leaving a great deal in Nashville to guard the city and supply lines. Bragg's force in Murfreesboro numbered about 35,000 troops. Bragg asked Brigadier General John A. Wharton how long he could delay the advancing Federals. Four days was the cavalry commander's reply. Wharton did a good job of harassing the Union Army, but it was the weather, the rain and sleet and mud that truly slowed down the blue troops. By December 30th, Rosecrans' tired force was just a few miles from Murfreesboro. Also on that day, Alexander McCook's right wing aggressively probed the Confederate line, but by sunset both armies prepared for the carnage of the next day. The Army of Tennessee was firmly dug in, and all Bragg had to do was wait for an attack and crush it in similar fashion to the way Robert E. Lee had done at Fredericksburg. However, Bragg went on the offensive. He shifted Hardy's Corps west to extend the Confederate line. He planned on attacking the vulnerable Union right flank, push into the Union Army's rear, and cut it off from Nashville. It was a bold move, and he was assembling an able-bodied force to conduct that attack. Conversely, Rosecrans was making plans to attack the next morning as well. Just like Bragg, he was going to use the troops on his left to fracture the Confederate right and cut the Army of Tennessee off from Murfreesboro. Both plans had their problems. One, Bragg hoped that once the army began falling back, that he could keep the momentum going. But if they couldn't, their only reserve was three miles and a river crossing away. Two, Rosecrans' assault columns would need at least an hour after daybreak to get across Stones River to make their attack. Plus, the Union right was extremely vulnerable. The wing commander, Alexander McCook, issued no orders to his troops in how to prepare, and the division commander on the extreme right was an incompetent general. It was ultimately going to come down to who attacked first, and in this case, it would be Bragg. The divisions of McCown and Claiborne positioned their men to overlap the Union right flank and were to be the sledgehammer against the Union line. During the night of December 30th, both sides battled back and forth, but not with rifles and artillery, but with music. The Union bands began playing Yankee Doodle, and the Confederate bands played Dixie. Eventually, both sides broke out into the same song, Home Sweet Home. As many of the soldiers sat in the cold, wet mud, shivering in the winter weather, many began to cry as the musicians played their melodic tunes. At 6 a.m., Union soldiers on the right flank slept and milled about their makeshift camps until their very own skirmishers ran through their lines, yelling, Here they come! Indeed, the Confederate attack was launching. McCown and Claiborne's men raced toward the enemy and slammed into Johnson's division of McCook's wing. The power with which the rebel lines hit the blue troops caused the Union flank to dissolve, and McCown's men pursued, raising the rebel yell, striking fear into the hearts of the retreating Federals. It looked like Bragg's plan had worked, and success was inevitable. However, there was a problem. Although McCown's men had done their job well, instead of performing a wheeling motion to the right in order to attack the Union regiments from the rear, his division went further to the west, opening up a wide gap in the Confederate line. Within less than an hour, the Union troops were on the run, 
but the battle was quickly coming apart for the Confederates. The adept Major General Patrick Claiborne, who was supposed to be acting as support for McCown, saw the gap and slipped his division into it. That's all he could have done, but now the punching power of the Confederate left was diminished. Amidst all the confusion, Brigadier General August Willock, the Prussian soldier turned American general, attempted to rally his troops, but found himself attempting to rally Confederates instead. He was taken prisoner and sent to Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia. There were a few standout commanders attempting to stem the Confederate tide. Colonel Post and his brigade swung back to the right, forming a line nearly perpendicular to his original placement. Elements of Claiborne's division under Bushrod Johnson and St. John Liddell attacked Post's men, and only the threat of his flank being turned forced Post to pull his men back toward the Gresham House. Colonel Philemon Baldwin was supposed to be in reserve, but once he heard the sound of battle, he had mobilized his brigade and went south. Post's men streamed past Baldwin, whose infantry and artillery checked the Confederate advance. McNair's brigade hit Baldwin in the flank, and his line, like all the rest, melted away under the pressure. On Claiborne's right, the brigade of Colonel William Carlin was hit by Wood's brigade in the front and Lucius Polk's brigade in the right flank. To the northeast, and at the same time that Wood's men were hit in Carlin's line, Colonel Loomis led his brigade against Woodruff's men, but the devastating fire from a Federal sent Loomis's men back. An artillery shell struck a tree and it fell on Loomis, and he was helped off the field. Behind Loomis was Vaughn's brigade, who tried their hand at attacking the Union line, but they were thrown back as well. However, Claiborne's men, after flanking Carlin's brigade, moved on Woodruff's flank, and the blue dominoes continued to fall. When the gray attackers got to Philip Sheridan's division, they encountered a little bit more resistance. Brigadier General Joshua Seal defended the right of Sheridan's line, and although the 36th Illinois and the 88th Illinois were swept aside by Manigault's attack, the 24th Wisconsin and 21st Michigan held out along with some artillery support. Then, as Seal was attempting to organize a counterattack, a bullet struck him in the head, killing him instantly. The rest of the brigade began to withdraw, but a few well-placed artillery volleys punctured the flank of Manigault's line and made them back away. The rebels returned, but with reinforcements, and shattered the Union line. Rosecrans quickly realized that his own plan to outflank the rebels was not going to be possible, and he quickly set about maneuvering more troops toward the right flank. The Union line was now bent back on itself and was in a precarious position, attempting to defend the vital Nashville Pike, its connection to the capital. It was around 10 a.m., and the day was firmly in Confederate hands. Rosecrans proved his worthiness at the Battle of Stones River. It was said that every Union soldier saw the man in person on the battlefield because he was constantly riding over that field, directing troops to their needed locations. It was truly a magnificent sight to see an army commander taking such a hands-on approach, and his effort was paying off. He was attempting to cobble together a nice defensive force to hold off the approaching rebels. However, appearances could be deceiving. Rosecrans was understandably nervous, and this led to hyperactivity. He would give orders to a brigade commander, but then ride to a regiment within that brigade and tell its colonel something different. The situation became very confused, and there would be some setbacks before the Union line stabilized. Just north of the Wilkinson Pike, General Negley's division held on for dear life as Union troops retreated through their ranks. Their position amidst a group of cedars and eroded limestone made a great location for soldiers to kneel down in the defiles to protect themselves from Confederate bullets. General Anderson had sent his regiments in piecemeal fashion and produced no results against the Blue Line. He asked General Stewart if he would send two regiments to help. Stewart refused and opted to send his entire brigade against Robert's men. Those Union troops fought doggedly to hold the ground, but they were quickly running out of ammunition. In the fight with Stewart's men, Roberts would be killed along with many officers for the Union. The lack of leadership and ammunition convinced Sheridan to order his brigades to withdraw. Stewart's men kept up the pressure against Stanley, but to the northwest, more units were leaving their posts. McCook, the right wing commander, was in the process of helping Rosecrans form up a defensive line closer to the Nashville Pike and approached Grusel's brigade and ordered them to fall back. It was a welcomed reprieve, but it was making the line untenable as more and more troops left the area. Next, Schaefer, without Roberts on his left or Grusel on his right, made the decision to leave the area. Now, just a few brigades were holding out against the overwhelming Confederate numbers from all sides. To the northwest, 
Raines' brigade made contact with Shepard's regulars, and a bitter fight erupted, but once the 11th Tennessee got around the flank of the regulars, the Union troops became concerned. Word came to Scribner and Shepard from their division commander, Lovell Rousseau, to withdraw, but Beatty was never given that order. His men sat and waited as the sound of battle approached more closely. Lucius Polk's brigade of Claiborne's division bounded through the cedars towards Beatty. The devastating fire from the Confederate rifled muskets tore into the left flank of the brigade, but just as they were about to falter, Beatty swung his leftmost regiments to the right and delivered an enfilading fire into Polk's men. It sent the rebels back, reeling from the surprise attack in their flank. Beatty used the lull to find out where his support was, but every message came back that he was essentially alone. Understanding the complete danger of his situation, he also pulled back. General Claiborne was now in a unique situation. There were resistance to his right, but his brigades were spread out nearly a mile apart. He sent both Polk and Johnson to the northwest to deal with a new Union threat in that sector, and that left Raines' brigade to march through the Cedars and toward the Nashville Pike all alone. Stanley and Miller's brigades were getting surrounded on all sides and running low on ammunition. Stanley's men began to falter and then give way to the enormous pressure. Miller's men held out until it was nearly impossible for them to escape, but after an exorbitant amount of bloodletting and the limestone outcropping, they retreated to the pike. After seeing the bloody scene, men from Chicago likened it to the slaughter pens they had witnessed in that city, and the name stuck. The slaughter pen would become synonymous with the Battle of Stones River. Just to the north, after Raines' men had forced the U.S. regulars to fall back to the pike, the two Georgia units in the brigade had lost contact with the rest of the regiments, leaving the young brigadier with only the 11th Tennessee and 29th North Carolina to attack the Union troops gathering around the pike. Raines was not foolish. He knew that Claiborne was right behind him, or so he thought. Claiborne's men were much further to the west, and this left the small brigade alone as it emerged from the cedars. The two regiments poured volleys into the enemy, but the iron and lead belched forth from the artillery and musketry by the Union troops tore holes into the gray line, and a bullet pierced the heart of Raines, killing him instantly. He was only 29 years old. Not too long after the failed attempt by Raines, Exer's brigade came out of the cedars and received a similar devastating fire from the Union troops positioned to protect the pike. Although Sam Beatty's brigade was fairly fresh compared to the other Federals, they began to waver as they exchanged volleys with the Texans, mainly because the retreating blue troops crashed through their lines and disorganized the regiments. However, Ector's men could not withstand the volleys and pulled back to the cover of the cedars. The reason for the lack of support was that fresh federal regiments were marching south to confront the Confederate juggernaut, and Claiborne was tasked with pushing them back, now becoming the far left flank of the rebel line. Three Union brigades approached Claiborne's men, but some well-placed artillery sent Harker's brigade far to the west in a panic, opening up a wide gap in the Union line. Fife sent messages to Harker saying to close up the breach, but he refused. Vaughn's brigade overlapped Fife, and the entire Federal line began to buckle with a few regiments being sent back toward the pike. Then as rebels poured through the gap, the whole line fell back. This was the moment that Claiborne was waiting for. If his division could make it to the Nashville pike, then the escape route for Rosecrans' army would be closed off, and the rest of the brigades could push the Federals into Stones River. The pike was in view as Claiborne urged his men forward. However, Rosecrans and his lieutenants had constructed a formidable defensive position along the pike, and the desperate soldiers were going to be a formidable opponent to the Irishman's troops. As the division approached the Union line, artillery and musketry let loose from the blue lines, and the gray line melted back to the rear. Most soldiers agreed that the volleys were not that disastrous, but the rebels retreated anyway. Claiborne gives the best explanation for his division's actions. It was after three o'clock. My men had had little or no rest the night before. They had been fighting since dawn, without relief, food, or water. They were comparatively without the support of artillery, for the advance had been too rapid to enable my single battery to get into position and answer the enemy. Their ammunition was again nearly exhausted, and our ordnance trains could not follow. Claiborne also had no support. Hardy and Polk both begged for reinforcements from Bragg, but the reinforcements which came from Breckenridge's division were sent to deal with an area that one historian describes as Bragg's obsession, a little grouping of trees called the Round Forest. While Claiborne was fighting his way north and beating back the brigades of Harker, Fife, and Beatty, the Confederate brigades, which had displaced Negley's men from the slaughter pen, 
were making their way north toward the Round Forest. Chalmers and Donaldson had already launched assaults against Cruft's and Hazen's brigades, resulting in the wounding of Chalmers and the defeat of Donaldson's men. Stewart's brigade surged forward but was met by musketry from Shepard's regulars, who had reformed after withdrawing from their earlier position. For about 20 minutes, the United States regulars took a battering from the rebels, but they also bloodied Stewart's men, so much so that when Shepard's men pulled back for the second time, most of Stewart's brigade could not move forward and remained in the woods, along with Maney's men. But the 8th and 38th Tennessee from Donaldson's brigade, along with the 19th Tennessee, pursued the Federals and engaged them in the open terrain. The bloodletting was enormous for both sides, and the 8th, by the end of the fighting, would suffer 68% casualties. Of the 440 men who went into battle, 41 were dead and 260 were wounded. To their credit, none were missing. To the east, two regiments of Sheridan's men were posted near the Round Forest, with the 2nd Missouri taking up a position on the right and the 15th Missouri being sent out as skirmishers. A lull emerged in that sector of the battlefield, and each side attempted to use it as time to shore up their positions. While all of this was transpiring, the pleading by Polk and Hardy for reinforcements resulted in Bragg sending for the brigades on the east side of the river commanded by John C. Breckinridge. A back and forth erupted between the two southerners as Breckinridge believed a large force was in front of him and didn't want to send away his troops across the river. Eventually, the Kentuckian relented and began sending over the brigades. Leonidas Polk was in charge of that sector, consistent of the Round Forest. When Adams' brigade made it to the bishop, Polk didn't want to send in the unit alone, but he had orders. At 2 p.m., Adams' men plunged forward with Jackson's men close behind, and they drove back the 15th Missouri. A bitter exchange yielded little results for the Confederates, but when two of Wagner's regiments moved forward and sent hundreds of rounds of lead into the gray troops, they were compelled to fall back. But that was not all the bloodshed in the quest for the round forest. Jackson had witnessed the failed attempt by Adams, but followed orders and advanced toward the forest. A Union soldier described the horrible scene. On they came in steady column, notwithstanding the murderous fire. We could see their men falling like leaves, but the broken ranks were filled, and they held their ground with a heroism worthy of a better cause. At last they had to yield, but they retired in good order, leaving their dead on the field. The Confederate line couldn't handle the return fire and limped back to safety. Breckinridge was irate at the bishop, who committed his brigades too soon and hadn't waited for the others. Palmer and Preston were the next brigades to contest the round forest. They formed into battle line. Palmer was on Preston's left, but both commanders could see the hundreds upon hundreds of wounded and dead in the cotton fields in front of them. The charge would be suicide. Both brigade commanders moved forward. But Palmer's men would never leave the Cedars, and in fact, moved deeper into them. According to Palmer, it was because Preston did not launch his attack. Preston's men, after getting hit with multiple artillery barrages, followed their leader into the woods instead of against the Federal stronghold, except for one company of the 60th North Carolina and the 20th Tennessee. Both of them pushed on toward the Union line and got to within 100 yards before Hazen's men let loose a volley and they ran to a patch of woods skirting the river. Nevertheless, the Union line at the Round Forest and the Nashville Pike held. Night and exhaustion prevented any further attacks or counterattacks by either side. The next day would be New Year's Day. Both sides had rang in the New Year with blood, and there would be more spilt over the next two days. It was impossible to supply all the wounded with tents. Rails were hauled and thrown in piles, and large fires built. The wounded were brought and lain by these fires. Men were wounded in every conceivable way, some with their arms shot off, some wounded in the body, some in the head. It was heartrending to hear their cries and groans. One poor fellow who was near me was wounded in the head. He grew delirious during the night and would very frequently call his mother. The poor fellow died before morning, with no mother near to soothe him in his dying moments or wipe the cold sweat from off his brow. I saw the surgeon amputate limbs, then throw the quivering flesh into a pile. Every once in a while, a man would stretch himself out and die. Next morning, rows of men were laid out side by side for their soldiers' burial. From the night of December 31st, 1862, and into New Year's Day, Union and Confederate wounded began trickling into their lines for medical help. Traveling by their own strength or with help from their comrades, 
they sought some kind of relief from the agony bestowed upon them in battle on the first day. The first day had been bloody, but successful for the Confederates who crushed the Union right flank and drove the Union troops back to the Nashville Pike. January 1st became a day of convalescing and planning. Corporal Hannaford of the 6th Ohio had been wounded during the fight on December 31st. He crawled to a safe location to take his final breaths, but as the day drug on and the battle came to a close, he found himself very much alive. He decided that an unsheltered night would mean death, so he fashioned a signal flag from a knit sleeping cap and a stick to get the attention of the ambulance corps picking up the wounded on the field. But to his dismay, none ever came within hailing distance. He concluded that the only way to save himself was to make his way to the field hospital, reluctantly leaving my blanket, my haversack, and canteen as a prize for some fortunate rebel. I wandered away back toward our lines, across those corn and cotton fields again, now strewn with the dead and wounded, our own blue and the rebel gray mingled together, heedless alike of the piteous calls and prayers from every side for the assistance I could not give and of the perils of shot and shell whistling past me, and at last I reached the turnpike, faint and exhausted. A little further down I came to a little low log cabin, with its strip of red flannel fluttering before it to indicate its present use, its two small rooms crowded hours before with the wounded and dying, and scores more sitting or lying around smoking fires on the outside. Ambulances were coming and going, freighted with the precious burden of maimed and helpless humanity, and still the wounded were accumulating constantly. Braxton Bragg hoped that his southern army had bloodied Rosecrans enough that the Union commander would begin a retreat and he could then pursue the blue troops, but as January 1st ended, Bragg realized the Army of the Cumberland was not moving anywhere. The only place that the Union line had not been attacked was on its far left flank. Reconnoitering missions revealed that the Federal troops were on both banks of the river occupying two hills vital the Confederates carrying the field of battle, one rise on the east bank and one rise on the west bank. Bragg didn't get along with John C. Breckinridge, but it was the Kentuckians' division that was the freshest and capable of making the attack. Bragg also ordered ten artillery pieces to augment the advance, but he also gave the Kentuckian the discretion of choosing the time of attack. Breckenridge, upon hearing his orders, rode to the location of the assault. On his way there, he met Generals Hardy and Polk. They talked about the attack near McFadden's Ford and concluded that it was too strong of a position to try to carry. Breckenridge, trying his best to comply with orders, went past his own picket line to investigate, a very dangerous situation for a general. Personally looking over the proposed ground convinced the former vice president that the attack shouldn't be made. Bragg called on Breckinridge to meet with him, and for two and a half hours the generals talked about the attack. Breckinridge tried to convince Bragg not to order the assault, but the southern army commander would not hear it. Bragg even told Breckinridge the time to attack, 4 p.m., but an hour before dark. The meeting ended at 2.30 and the division commander rode off to form his brigades. The time of the assault may have seemed odd, but there was logic in the timing. If Breckinridge's division could successfully take the hill near McFadden's Ford, darkness would prevent the Union from launching a counterattack. For Rosecrans, he began getting reports from Colonel Samuel Beatty that artillery and infantry were moving in his front and that it could result in a major attack. Beatty's division was on the east bank of the river, the troops Bragg wanted driven to the other side. Rosecrans acted quickly and by 3 p.m had assembled four brigades in reserve behind Beatty, overlooking McFadden's Ford. One brigade from Brigadier General John Palmer's division, two brigades from Brigadier General James S. Negley's division, and Morton's Pioneer Brigade. Breckinridge had another problem up here within his division prior to the assault. Arriving on the field of battle an hour before the division was to step off, Gideon Pillow, an incredibly well-connected Tennessee politician, had used his political ties to gain a generalship in the Mexican-American War, and he did the same thing in the Civil War. He had been suspended in April 1862 by President Davis, and Pillow resigned in October of that same year. But Davis rescinded the resignation and allowed him to take command again. Pillow was also good friends with Braxton Bragg, one of the few the Army commander had, and it was that relationship that gained him command of a brigade 
under Breckenridge during the attack, replacing Colonel Joseph Palmer, a more competent commander. Breckenridge hit another snag when he wanted the artillery assigned to him to place themselves between the 1st Line Brigades and the 2nd Line Brigades. Captain Robertson of the artillery refused to accommodate the division commander. Breckenridge then asked him to have his artillery follow close behind the 2nd Line, but again Robertson refused. He insisted that Bragg wanted his artillery to push forward only when the infantry had taken the hill on the east bank. Breckenridge had to relent, but his own divisional artillery would follow behind the second line. More drama encompassed the Confederate ranks when General Hanson, commander of the Orphan Brigade, heard the orders that Breckenridge passed down to him from Bragg. Hanson said the orders was tantamount to murder and that he would kill Bragg to prevent it from happening. Both Breckenridge and fellow brigade commander, General Preston, had to restrain Hanson. The regiments were instructed to load and fix bayonets. They were to close with the enemy, fire one volley, and then drive them with the bayonet. At about 4 p.m., the signal gun sounded and the Kentuckians division stepped off, but a small pond next to the river slowed down the 6th Kentucky, so they lagged behind the rest of the brigade. Breckenridge himself followed close behind the orphan brigade, made up of mostly Kentuckians as they pushed forward. The Federal troops had thrown up makeshift breastworks, but were only able to get off a few small volleys before they began to fall back to the second line. The rebels surged forward and took much of the knoll that was their objective, but they had lost their commander. Breckenridge and his staff were within a few yards of Price's abandoned breastworks when they spotted Hanson, lying alone against a fence. A shell fragment had gashed his leg and sliced open the femoral artery. Breckenridge tried vainly to stop the bleeding and his staff summoned an ambulance. It was a sight indelibly impressed on my memory. The dying hero, his distinguished friend and commander kneeling by his side holding back the lifeblood. All this under the fiercest fire of artillery that can be conceived made it ever memorable. The scene passed almost as quick as it takes to write it. General Hanson was promptly moved by the ambulance. Breckenridge was soon as alert and clear-headed as ever. Hanson knew that the wound was mortal and told the surgeon to leave him and tend to the wounded men of his brigade. While Hanson's bravery was admired by Breckenridge, the former vice president, as he watched over the first line, found General Gideon Pillow cowering behind a tree as his men exchanged volleys with the blue troops. The words used by Breckenridge to get Pillow back into line to lead the brigade can only be imagined, but the division commander was irate, especially after seeing how Hanson had acted. Both sides threw lead at one another, but the Confederate front line became entangled with one another. Additionally, they had compacted themselves into a small area, allowing Fife's brigade to deliver enfilading fire into Pillow's flank. The 20th Tennessee in the second line came to Pillow's rescue, along with Wright's artillery, and fought off the 44th Indiana and 13th Ohio. But that still did not solve the problem of intermingled regiments, so confusion reigned throughout the front line. There was not much else to do but move forward for the Confederates, but as the gray-clad troops prepared for a charge, the mascot of one of the Kentucky regiments in the Orphan Brigade, a dog named Frank, began chasing after a rabbit. A few of the Kentuckians raised a cheer of encouragement, then more until the entire line was yelling wildly. Believing they were about to be charged, the Federals unleashed a volley into the Kentuckians that flew over their heads, but it caused the rabbit to change directions toward the Kentuckians with Frank in hot pursuit. One soldier yelled, run, cottontail, run. Had I no more a reputation to sustain than you, I would run too. Although the Union line was holding, it would not be doing so for long if help did not arrive. Beatty ordered Grider's brigade forward to check the Confederate charge, and it worked, but a few Confederates had splashed across the river and threatened the Union flank. Fife's brigade began to waver when their commander was thrown from and dragged by his horse, injuring him badly. The Union left fell back, with Gross's brigade providing a safe place for the front line to fall back behind, but the Confederates were on the move. When Breckenridge's division began to break the Union lines earlier in the battle, the Union High Command went into work like a well-oiled machine behind the Union lines, creating one of the most heroic and determined actions of the war. Rosecrans exhausted his horse, riding around the battlefield rallying retreating men and ordering up reinforcements to support the Union left. Sweat poured from his face as he coordinated more brigades and artillery pieces. 
Major General Thomas Crittenden's Chief of Artillery, Captain John Mendenhall, performed a miraculous action by tirelessly assembling 45 pieces of artillery on the hill overlooking McFadden's Ford to halt the Confederate advance. The Union cannons roared a destructive fire into the approaching Southerner. A member of the 20th Tennessee described it as such. So it was here if a soldier ever saw the lightning and heard the thunderbolts of a tornado, at the same time the heavens opened and the stars of destruction were sweeping everything from the face of the earth. If he was in this charge, he saw it. A Union soldier wrote, The very earth trembled as with an exploding mine, and a mass of iron hail was hurled upon them. The artillery bellowed forth such thunder that the men were stunned and could not distinguish sounds. There were falling timbers, crashing arms, and the whirring of missiles in every direction. The bursting of the dreadful shell, the groans of the wounded, the shouts of the officers mingled in one horrid din that beggars description. It stopped Breckinridge's division in its tracks, and for many of the Southerners, the devastation was too much to withstand again. They broke and ran for cover. The blue troops chasing after and capturing hundreds and shot the ones who would not surrender in the back. Artillery shells exploded all around the retreating men. One soldier on his way back to safety attempted to commandeer a riderless horse, but as he grabbed the reins, a shell carried away its head. Breckinridge's artillery that had advanced with the infantry was put in a horrible situation as the infantry retreated. Wright's battery on the far right attempted to halt the Federals so the infantry could get away, but at about 70 yards away, he ordered the pieces to limber. But as they were about to ride away, he ordered them to unlimber and fire double canister. The cannoneers did as they were told. The enemy troops were too close, and the guns were captured. Other guns were able to get away, but Captain Wright would be killed. Breckenridge watched in horror as his division limped back to safety. He exclaimed, My poor orphans, my poor orphans. The success felt by the Confederates on December 31st gave way to defeat by nightfall on January 2nd. The next day, Bragg would begin his retreat to Tullahoma, Tennessee. The Union lost 12,906 men, 1,677 killed, 7,543 wounded, 3,686 missing and captured. The Confederacy lost 11,739 troops, 1,294 killed, 7,945 wounded, and 2,500 missing and captured totaling over 24,000 casualties in one battle. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you'd like to vote on the next battle, please go to the Patreon page and join. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far. History will travel, reads the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland. To educate the world is his mission. A professor of fortune is a man called historian. Historian